You bring your phone everywhere. Work, school, Shh. the movies. Now you can bring it to an Xfinity store for an easy way to switch to Xfinity Mobile, a new kind of network designed to save you money. You can get up to five lines of talk and text included with Xfinity Internet at no extra cost, so all you pay for is data. It's never been easier to switch to Xfinity Mobile and keep the phone you love. Click here to see how. Sorry, I gotta take this. Restrictions apply. Limited to select mobile phones. Requires activation of a new line of Xfinity Mobile. Up to five devices per account. New Xfinity Internet customers limited to up to two lines pending activation of Internet service. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, this is Damn You Hollywood. And here's your host, that paragon of nihilism, the king of stinging rebukes, Robert, everyone loves a bad guy, Winfrey. Yay, me. Uh, All right, with my enthusiasm out of the way. Hi, everyone, and welcome to, as Mark mentioned, Damn You Hollywood. Uh, Brief note, I can actually hear that song playing. I don't know why that is, but I can kind of hear it. Do you want me to tell you why? Yeah, why? Um, Hello, everyone. I'm Mark Radledge, your mandated reporter, and frankly, I'm mortified. The reason why you can kind of hear that is what you're getting is this. These are not this this is a game, uh, a gaming headset that I'm wearing. Um, so the sound leaks from my ears, uh, from, from the part that's covering my ears, uh, the cans, if you will, and it's leaking into my microphone. Huh. That's why you're getting uh, that. Good to know. Yeah, that's, it's not Spreaker. I know it wasn't Spreaker, I was wondering why I could hear it, because I, again, kind of could, so. Does that mean All you right, don't want me the... to do that intro anymore? You don't want me to flavor flave you up? I want to flavor flave you up. I mean, look, it's a two-man show. We don't need a fluffer. <laughs> but I don't, I don't mind fluffing you, Robert Winfrey. Arr, you, you really, you really would. <laughs> that, that would not be a pleasant experience. <laughs> All right, get on with this nonsense. All right, more nonsense. On that note. All right. Again, this is Damn You Hollywood, everyone. This is the first Damn You Hollywood on Spreaker, as our last edition was the, uh, you know, I would love to say it was the straw that broke the camel's back, but uh, (laughs) let's face it, it was a brick. (laughs) Um, (laughs) This was the anvil that Wile E. Coyote (laughs) dropped from a helicopter that it missed the roadrunner and it hit our poor metaphorical (laughs) camel. (laughs) And we had just, we threw up our hands, we said, that's it, we've had it, it's all we can stands, we can't stands no more. Uh, so, the, that's kind of the impetus for the minor bit of shop talk in the beginning there. Uh, tonight we will be reviewing Death Wish. I, 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 uh, 
Mark. Why? Just why? What do you mean why? Why are, did you do are this? You, are you not? Are you new? I'm sorry. Are have you not done this podcast before? No, no, no. I'm asking why this specifically. Like, because this doesn't. Okay, let's stop for a second. In only the I have, loosest of I have terms questions. does this meet the criteria. Well, no, wait a minute. I have. Are you asking me why did I choose to review this? Or are you asking me why did they choose to remake this? Yes. All right. Um, I have the faintest idea what possessed the studio other than sort of a stock everything that is old is new and there's no new ideas left in Hollywood. I mean, that's the kind of thing you throw out there when you really don't have any answers. And frankly, I don't have any answers. I have no earthly clue what possessed the studio. What studio was this? What possessed the studio to, to think this was a good idea? But that being said, why did I pick it? Because... Uh, this was Scott Free and MGM. Okay, well, it's not like they've had a decent hit on their hands lately. Um, Still don't, actually. <laughs> yeah, this one, <laughs> this is this is not doing well. Um, it'll be I'll be curious to see if it if it actually makes its uh, budget back. But that being said, uh, I chose it because the stock and trade of this show is first blockbusters, then this is not. Than uh, remakes, reboots of things that are um, paragons its, of the that's culture. That's its own criteria. When did we add that? I, I was not privy to that being added to the list of criteria. What do you wait a minute? What do you mean? I don't understand. It, it feels like every other reboot or remake that we've had to review large fell into the larger criteria of either major blockbusters or fran- or entries into a franchise, things of that nature. This is the first time that the only like justification for it being on this show is, well, it's a remake of something that people love. Right. It also gave me the opportunity to book a on trial about the original, which I like to do. I like to, when these... Robert Winfrey, when these remakes come out, Go ahead and say synergy. Just say it. We know you want. Just say synergy. Synergy, Robert Winfrey. I, I why hate you so much? <laughs> why Death Wish? Because synergy. These opportunities allow me and those who podcast with me to compare the new to the original, the new to the old. By the way, Scarface apparently fell off the calendar, so you dodged a bullet there. I'm not sure I did. I was kind of looking forward to that. Mm. Um, Only because the Coen brothers were the ones doing it. Okay. And plus the fundamental the fundamentals of the Scarface story. I mean, the, um, the Al Pacino version. Mm-hmm. I forget who directed it. Brian somebody, I want to say. De Palma? Maybe. I think it was De Palma. To, I'd have to look it up. I'm going with De Palma until corrected. But that was a remake of a nineteen like thirty seven uh, black and white mob era film. Like this, this is this is the type of story that can be updated every you know twenty years or so. And since the most recent one came out mid eighties, so twenty thirty years, it, a, a reintroduction, a remake of that with the. Um, under the guise of contemporary sensibilities is not necessarily uncalled for or unwarranted. And let's be fair, it's not like either previous version of Scarface is the is cinematic perfection. Well, let They're me both ask, good. Let me ask you this. Considering what we're talking about tonight, we're talking about Death Wish. And Death Wish, at its core, is the fantasy that an aggrieved person can take the law into their own hands by virtue of getting a gun and shooting it at who they perceive to be their enemy. Don't you think that Death Wish is a modern-day parable 
especially with what's going on in the news lately, don't you? With, I mean, I don't know if this was the intention or not. I don't know if anyone, at, you know, at MGM really sat it's around. It's Eli going, Roth. Con- <laughs> intention is not part of what he does. Okay, again, but the Eli Roth did not finance this film by himself. You know, people had to agree on this. Um, you know, this had to be produced by someone because people had to invest in it. But I, I, I Eli imagine- Roth's production company, I seem to recall. I, I can imagine there being at least some degree of a conversation of, you know, with all the talk of shootings in the news and whatnot, and, you know, an entire election revolving around the perception uh, that a particular part of the population was aggrieved and put upon and felt powerless, and so they elected who they elected because they felt like they that person would empower them. Don't you think Death Wish comes along at a time where... Uh, where it sort of it, it meets that uh, that part of the culture, because I did. I thought I thought Death Wish, whether they meant to or not, was was very reflective of the national conversation about guns, about an, you know an aggrieved part of the population, about powerlessness, all of that. Now, whether or not they did a great job of it, that's what we'll debate later on in the show. But I thought the intention, you know, was there. Or am I, or, or, or am I ascribing a lot to this movie that nobody intended? Mostly the latter, <laughs> which is okay. and look, which is fine for the the last like fifteen or twenty years of criticism and intellectual debate surrounding fictional material has essentially done a good job of either completely throwing out or at least severely diminishing authorial intent. So we can we can ascribe things to this film that it's that no one attached to it did, and that's perfectly acceptable. So, why Death Wish? Because I believe that its themes are part of the national conversation that's happening right now, and that nothing is more modern, nothing is more uh, current than Death Wish. And I, and I think our conversation tonight it contri- contributes to the national conversation. How do you like that? We're doing a service. Dude, look, I'm nihilistic and you're narcissistic. We need we need to come up with a better nickname for this, apparently. <laughs> More importantly, you and I have, like... For those of you who don't know, I'm going to piss off a significant portion of our listener base probably by doing this. For those of you that don't know... We're both white. Mark and I both... Not only are we white... I mean, you're Jewish, I seem to recall. In some form or fashion, sure. I mean, the last name doesn't, you know... <laughs> Mom's ethnic, Jewish, Dad's Catholic, like move it on. Uh, yeah. I'm LDS, but we're both conservative, generally speaking. And... <laughs> consequently, like... if So if you listen to the majority of leftist politics and policies our perspectives don't matter because we are not the aggrieved parties in society <sighs> but anyway you're not here to listen to us talk politics Mark used to have a podcast that was politics this isn't it <laughs> and I don't ever want to do that again <laughs> <laughs> come on you had fun uh, look I had fun when I was making chicken noises but you know I <laughs> I have, I have, look, I, I talk enough, I, I can talk politics in a comic book show, I can talk politics in a movie review, I don't need an entire show dedicated to it. Anyway, we all know you also didn't answer the real reason about why you chose this movie. What's the real reason, Robert Winfrey? You hate me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's because you hate me. If you think this schedule's bad, wait till you see next year. Look, you plan. Go ahead and plan out next year's right now, and then I want you to send me a dime each time you have to change it. <laughs> okay, you got. Well, th- that seems a little rich for my blood. Will you take a penny? Will you take a hey no. penny? I'd take a nickel. Okay, maybe, maybe I'll maybe I can do a nickel. I will go ahead and set the movie schedule for 2019, and every time I have to move something, send you a nickel. And yeah. you will die a rich man. Um, at the close of and at the close of 2019, mm-hmm. 
I want to I want a tally to be read on air, then I want to check. <laughs> okay. So you want to tell people what Death Wish is about? <sighs> it's not about anything. It just kind of exists. Oh, it's about <laughs> something. Can I can I just give a, can I give away something right now, real quick? And and I don't want to sure. go off too much on a tangent here. By the way, my father listened to one of our reviews, and. He was like, after 20 minutes of you not reviewing anything and doing whatever opening shtick that was, I gave up and turned it off. Apparently. <laughs> apparently, me and you are a little long in the tooth in our opening yeah, shtick. Yeah, a little. We, we, do need to, we do need to hem that in. Um, we, are, we are dangerously close to Jim Cornette and uh, Brian Last levels of, of putting off we getting good... No, have you? Yeah, the, half their half the list the um the, the drive through now is their opening bit, and the show's only an hour long. And all right, yeah, <laughs> this is why you and I go three hours usually. This is the first hour. Uh, all right, stick. all right. So moving on, you wanted to give something away. I actually like this a lot better than I like the original. And you are a terrible human being. <laughs> well, you go ahead and give the plot summary, and then when we come back to me, I will explain why I actually think this this remake of the novel is the superior version of that piece of source material. How do you like that? I can I can actually guess at why you think this is better. <laughs> well, it's not it's not black folks. I can tell you that much. You're married to conventional narrative structure, and this follows a conventional narrative, narratively structured plot. The original Charles Bronson movie does not. Uh, that's very true. I don't know if married to it. Married makes it. Married makes it seem like, like Dude, I, you hate I, Caddyshack because it doesn't follow conventional narrative. I've structure. never seen Caddyshack. That's a bad example. You, will, you would hate Caddyshack because it does not follow conventional narrative structure. Okay. I, you would you laugh know, at Bill what, Murray. Why don't you? Bill Murray's hilarious. Why don't you make me watch Caddyshack in one of the not oh, in, in one of the uh, days that we don't have open, and then we can settle this once and for all. In the meantime, tell these you fucking mean, people what this movie's about. You mean one day in 2024? <laughs> Here's your nickel. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, all right. As for the movie, this is again a remake of the. 1974 film, I believe, starring Charles Bronson, which is a cult classic, which is itself based on a novel by Brian Garfield. I should know that guy's name, but for some reason... Yeah. Um, I actually think this is the worst essential adaptation of this source material, but I'll get to that in a minute. Uh, we follow... We First of all, this story is very obviously set in the city of Chicago, because every ten minutes it tells you we're in Chicago. Uh, <laughs> it just does. Lest you think we are in New York or Los Angeles or some other major metropolitan area with sky-high instances of gun crime. Gun Baltimore. crime, not gun violence. Baltimore. Mind you, gun violence is 60% suicide and suicide attempts. Baltimore. Whatever. Jacksonville. <laughs> Atlanta. Hotlanta. Woohoo, Miami. Again, there's a lot of places that you could theoretically set this movie, and because they don't go out of their way to show you anything culturally significant about the city, they just have to tell you, hey, Chicago, via morning radio talk show hosts. Anyway, we follow Bruce Willis. Uh, it's Bruce Willis. <laughs> uh, playing Dr. Paul Kersey. He's just living the good life. Uh, that's all he is. That's all he's doing. He's a trauma surgeon. He's got a daughter who just got accepted to NYU. He's got an attractive wife. He's got kind of a deadbeat but good-meaning brother in the form of Vincent D'Onofrio, who is utterly wasted in this movie. And I don't mean that he's drunk. <laughs> uh, although I, ca I can't say one way or the other about that. Someone who shot the movie would have to tell me that, but uh, I'll get to that in a second. Uh, his life is completely, essentially destroyed when his house is broken into when his wife and daughter are home. They were not supposed to be home, but because he works in a hospital, schedules got shifted. He wound up at the hospital working, and they wound up at home making a birthday cake for him because let's just try to concoct the saddest possible confluence of events and then ignore them later on. <clears throat> 
Uh, the burglars break in. There's three of them. They're surprised because there weren't supposed to be people home, but hey, we're already here. We already have our nifty masks on. Let's just go through with this. As they rob the place, one of them tries to get a little uh, frisky with the daughter. This ends badly. She cuts him in the face. He takes his mask off, and now they've seen us, so the other guy in an issue of, well, they've seen our faces, simply shoots both of them. Uh, they're taken to the ER where Dr. Kersey is working. The wife dies. The daughter winds up in a coma. Uh, the doctor winds up talking with Dean Norris, which is not the worst way to spend a few hours, but talks with the police, gives them all the information that he has, and proceeds to kind of trust the system to sort itself out. Time passes, and it doesn't, it doesn't, and it doesn't, and it doesn't, and he becomes slightly more unstable, trying to get through the grieving process. He becomes erratic. Uh, he tries to stop some crime and gets his ass kicked because he doesn't know how to fight. It's a lifelong acquired skill. And, like, most people who don't have the physical tools decides, you know, firearms are a good thing. And they are. I am very pro-gun. But the, the gun laws in the city of Chicago are the strictest in the entire country. And he kind of gets second thoughts about actually buying one. So he goes back to the back at work. He gets uh, one from a patient. It falls out of his pant leg. And rather than turn it into the authorities and, you know, do his duty as a physician, he keeps it. Uh, he spends a lot of time practicing with it, which I appreciated them showing. He gets better at handling, at firing, uh, the whole nine yards. Then is out walking around looking for an excuse to shoot someone, essentially. He stops a carjacking. That's what he's doing. He is literally out looking for an excuse to shoot someone. Let's not mince words about that. <laughs> He stops a carjacking, he, sh he shoots and kills the two carjackers, he becomes a viral internet sensation because apparently that's what you do. I mean, in an effort to try and make this about something and show some of the cultural significance of this film, we have to then in the actual film make it a viral thing. And he feels slightly better about himself. He can sleep at night. I mean, he watches people die all the time in the ER. You'd think that would serve the same purpose, but... Anyway. Uh, again, he feels a little bit better. He has somewhat rediscovered his purpose. He kills a local drug dealer who shot a kid in the leg. Uh, his myth and legend grows. He runs across someone who he recognizes as being associated with his family's and with the death of his wife and his family's assault. And begins doing some amateur investigation into it, which is somehow infinitely more effective than what the police have done or are capable of. <laughs> well, in, in his defense, the police didn't use torture. Or, you know, have access to technology or, or you know, willing witnesses or, I mean... Yeah. Oh, hang on, you're missing a key plot detail here. Um, the guy that tipped off the robbers, he gets shot, and his phone uh, falls out of his pocket. Bruce Willis uh, picks it up, and unbeknownst to everybody else in the operating room, takes the phone, starts to go through it, and realizes, hey, wait a minute, this guy uh, is the one that tipped him off to my family. He was the valet at the restaurant that we were at. And there's a contact in here, and thus begins his investigation. And my point there is, had he just... You know, he could have easily... Nah, never mind. I'll get to that later. I don't want to derail this before I actually get through the plot. Uh, some mediocre scenes of torture and violence follow as he kills two of the three people who attacked his family. The third one Eli is actually... Because it's an Eli Roth film. Ugh. We'll get to that. <laughs> Uh, believe me, I have things to say about that. Uh, the third guy is the one who's actually apparently the sociopath. There's a gunfight at a nightclub, very brief gunfight. They both get wounded. Uh, the gunman then fingers, you know, Doctor Kersey as the Grim Reaper, as this particular, as his you know persona has become known. But there's not a lot of evidence besides the word of a convicted scumbag. So the cops are somewhat reticent to go through a full-on, you know, prosecution of 
This guy, when they have, again, no corroborating evidence. <laughs> but his daughter wakes up around then, and he decides he wants to try and move on from vigilante justice. But the last guy is still alive, and he now wants revenge for, you know, being shot, and he's worried about the daughter being able to identify him. So, in our final uh, shootout, he and a couple of compatriots uh, assault the house again. Bruce Willis is ready. He kills all three of them. Uh, the police show up, but he has a plausible... I mean, to be fair, at this point, they invaded his home with automatic weapons. So, yeah, he's well within his right to, you know, defend himself with deadly force. He expresses his belief that he has moved beyond the need to run around the streets of Chicago at night or during the day in some cases and randomly murdering people for breaking the law. His daughter goes out to college and he presumably will find love in the sequel. I don't know. I mean... <laughs> Uh, you feel like I gave anything short shrift there? Anything that you want to... No, I mean, the stuff with Vincent D'Onofrio... <laughs> could have been removed? Yeah, it could have easily been removed, and it's not really worth talking about. Um, okay. So, I know you're dying to ask me, what why did I like this movie? Why did I feel like this is superior to, uh, to the original? Uh, sure. Why do you... F uh, again, I'm 90% sure I know, but why do you feel this was better than the original? Well, as as you said, um, we're talking about conventional narrative structure. If the idea that this is about something, there is a mystery that is... Um, that is put upon our hero that he goes about solving there uh if the movie is about revenge and he enacts his revenge about on the people that hurt him and his family uh, as opposed to the original which is yeah his family was attacked but then he killed a bunch of random muggers none of which connected to the original attack and so the movie could have been five hours long and the same thing would have happened. There, it, it was a matter of how long does this need to go before we get to the point where the cop says, listen, get out of the city and I'll throw your gun in the river. Well, we don't want to cause a widespread panic here and we don't want to make ourselves look like asses and we don't want to make you a folk hero. So we're going to forgive you for murdering a bunch of random muggers, which I thought was really weak as opposed to Bruce Willis went on a vengeance run that ended with the last man who hurt his family. Now, if that's I'm married to conventional uh, narrative structure, fine, guilty as charged. But to me, that's a stronger tale than the original. Now, this isn't on trial, and I'll go ahead and, and make further arguments this Thursday which you'll be able to then download on Friday on the Rattle Legion Broadcasting Network on Spreaker. But to round this back to our topic at hand, with is the remake of Death Wish 2018, yeah. I I mean, here's what I don't understand about you and, 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 and a lot of people who may not have liked this film, but are fans of Punisher comics. Because for the longest time, I wasn't a fan of Punisher comics because... When I read comics, I like, you know, Green Lantern. Here's a guy with a magic ring who can do fun stuff, and I like the color green. Um, you know, let, let's talk about Thor. Thor is a god. He's super strong. He has a magic hammer. He can shoot lightning bolts. You know, the, the Hulk. He's the big, giant, green monster. These are fantastic and wonderful creatures of myth and mythology. I know myth is short for mythology, but go with me here. Um, Punisher was a guy with a gun who shot his way through New York. As much as I loved Welcome Back Frank, or Welcome Home Frank, whatever it was called, I said on Source Material at the time, other than that Ma Nucci is a celestial being, and I still believe that, Ma Nucci got that ill communication, all that comic is is the Punisher gunning his way through, Ma Nucci, through the Nucci family. 
the, for me to really get behind a story where this is why I don't watch films like like the John Wick movies and you know a lot of these where it's just a guy with a gun who appears to who took who is supposed to be an ordinary human being you know or the Bourne movies that's another good example I hate a lot of these movies it's these, these you know these people who don't have any actual superpowers but are made to be superhuman and they just gun their way through everything or ninja fight their way through everything and some of these have better, better narratives than others but I think that this movie worked on a couple of different levels they were simple levels but they still worked and, I, and, and before I go too far into that I, I, I want to round this back to the initial issue I had with you and, and others which is how do you and I, want to, and I want to come back to elements of the film very quickly so we're going to just bat this around right quick but how do you laud the Punisher series but think this is dumb as shit? It's a guy gunning people down, and at least this one had, you know, this, this story has a beginning, a middle, and an end. Vengeance, you know, vengeance is had. The, the, good, guy, the, the good guy wins. The bad guys are punished. It comes full circle. Well, why is that so much worse than, like I said, the Punisher, who it's just an endless slaughter? If I really have to explain why I feel the Netflix Punisher series is superior to this in every single way, you I'm not really don't whoa, know whoa, whoa, whoa. I'm not comparing it to the Netflix Punisher. I'm comparing it to the Punisher comic book character. I don't read all. comics. Okay. Well, I'm the wrong guy to have that discussion with. All right, Jesse Starcher, if you're out there, this is a recording. Uh, <laughs> you can't be out there. No one's hearing this right now. Um, but they will when it's uploaded. To the Rattle Legend Broadcasting Network on Spreaker. But, I mean, okay, so you're not the best person to ask, but I feel like the I feel like that's a valid question to ask people. Um, and, okay, so take the Punisher out of there. But any one of these figures in media who, you know, the big attraction to them is watching them mow down people with a gun, why, why does this one fail and those succeed? All right, let's take John Wick as okay. an issue of specificity. I'm not the biggest fan of the first John Wick, and I haven't seen the second. There's a couple of reasons that John Wick works more than this. One is world immersion. John Wick goes out of its way to establish rules for the world that it operates in. I'm missing something here. You're going to have to give me 50 words or less on what you're talking about. I don't explain it better than that. Is this, No, I mean, I mean, I would assume John Wick is a guy with a gun mowing down people in the mob. Am I, what, John am I, Wick was... Oh, you haven't have, you haven't seen the movie? No. Oh, God. Okay. Quick plot synopsis of John Wick. John Wick is a retired hitman who worked almost exclusively for the Russian mafia. He okay. was they referred to him as the boogeyman. He was able to extricate himself from the mob when he got married by performing what they referred to as an impossible task. The godfather of the Russian mafia gave him something that he thought, you're going to die doing this. And he did it. He is a... He, he is very clearly established as having violent capabilities. His wife dies of cancer. He's depressed. She sent him a... She, you know, time to release sent him a puppy to try and, you know, get his heart going again. You need something to love and the love is you and we're, you, you need to connect to the world again because... You're fundamentally a good person, but you spend a lot of time in violence. Now that I'm gone, you still need you know, something good in your life. Uh, snotty son of the Russian godfather does not know who John Wick is and is annoyed at being insulted by him and doing a random encounter at a gas station. Breaks into his house, breaks his arm, kills his dog, steals his car, and drives off. Cue murderous rampage from John Wick. I'm failing to see the... I'm failing to see in large part the difference and in, in small part yes there are obviously details that are different but again man with gun mow people down You're... well there's okay there's a couple of things that are one John Wick does actually have a beginning middle and end it is okay. very clearly a it is very it is structured in that same way mm -hmm. two there are you have to see that. Like, I, I don't want to go off on a tangent, like trying to explain the world of John Wick, but 
So just explain why John Wick works and why Death Wish doesn't. Okay. Okay, one is world immersion. John Wick has... It does set up a subset of rules by which the criminal underworld operates that allows you to feel like you're part of that world, whereas this is generic and bland. Okay. Two is the action sequences. This is the primary defining feature. John Wick is extraordinarily well choreographed and well shot. Okay. It has it has some brilliantly se- uh, shot and ex- and you know edited scenes of gunplay. It has some really good fight sequences. So let me jump and, in here. Your issue is less with the motif and more with the style. It's it's in the execution. Like, okay. Again, the motif is the motif. Some people are going to be attracted to it. Some people are not. The same is true of. Again, it's a revenge movie. Some people are. Some people like revenge movies. Some people don't. Fair. Okay, but that's but that's where I'm drawing a. But that's where I'm drawing an issue, because I I totally I understand some are done stylistically better than others. Some are executed better than others. And fine, Death Wish, Death Wish has its problems in execution and style. I'll grant you that, but a my lot of them. but my frustration I think is that people are having an issue with the motif in and of itself, and let's let's just pull out the ones that are tripping over themselves, and we'll get to this when we get to the Rotten Tomato reviews. But let's just remove that entire section of the review community that hates it because and is tripping over themselves to get to a microphone to yell how much they hate this movie because white people and guns. Okay. They don't count. Um, they're terrible. But there are people who are who are having an issue with the motif of of of, of generally the idea, just, just the concept of a person with a gun mowing down faceless bad guys. To which again I say, but we've loved it for so long. Why all of a sudden are we looking like like we we love the Punisher, we love John Wick, we love Jason Bourne, we love this, we love that. We get to Death Wish and we go, wait, fuck this movie, which I don't understand. I imagine a lot of people aren't properly articulating their issues. <laughs> again, look, I'll be look again. For me, it's not about the motif; it's about the execution. Okay. I have serious issues with this movie, not because I hate revenge movies. I like revenge movies. They are deeply cathartic. Okay. As a man with an appetite for violence, I can appreciate the majority of them on that level. But they but they must be executed in a, okay. but they have to be executed properly. I don't believe this one was, and that's my biggest gripe with it. Okay, and that's fair. Here's what I and and again, the last point of comparison, and then I'm just going to stick with focusing on the film itself. But well, that's kind of what I hated about Bronson's Death Wish, which was that just seemed to be a celebration of violence for violence's sake. You can call what you know him going from a you know liberal tree hugger to a gun to a, to a conservative gun nut as a kind of an arc, but you know, but ultimately, I I just felt like I was watching. I, <laughs> I felt like I was just watching, you know, uh, murder porn. And it said, I don't think it said anything about the culture at large. I understand people look back on it with, um, uh, not novelty, but... Uh, uh, rose-colored glasses? Rose, yeah, there was another phrase I wanted to use. But yeah, rose-colored, nostalgia glasses. That's the one. Um, people look back on it with nostalgia glasses for what it was at its to- at, at the time and for what it's it's meant to people over the years and, and what it is in the in the cultural lexicon. But as somebody who had never seen it before and is watching it in 2018, the movie sucks. It's it's fucking terrible. Um, this one at least has a point. It's a simple point, and we can talk about the style and, and execution as being problematic, but. Essentially, you have a man who is trying to, you know, lead the good life in 2018, take care of his family, obey the laws, and stop me if you've heard this one before, but suddenly it all, the rug gets taken out from under him. Everything he knows and loves is shattered, and he's asking himself, what did I do to deserve this? Bruce Willis, you can argue that his performance 
and his portrayal of a character who feels aggrieved and wronged is um, bad. Bad. I was going to go with it poor, <laughs> but it's still there. He's still attempting to, to 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 emote these things, and in some cases, he outright says them. And that because was he is not allowed to emote because of the terrible screenwriting. Um, but that was highly identifiable, and I thought highly thematic in 2018. That was for me the draw. So. There's a significantly better version of this that came out four or five years ago starring Kevin Bacon called Death Sentence. Okay. That's not the movie we're reviewing. You're at, you know, we're here to review Death Wish, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm okay with you bringing that up, but the movie that I went to, I didn't go to see five movies about Venge, you know, and, and, and to rank them. I went in to see Death Wish, and I came out of it going, well, I've seen better, um, but I've seen worse, and here's what You've I like about worse. it. worse. <laughs> Yes, I've seen worse. Um, and, and here's Day what I like three. about it. I like the themes of the movie. I like what the movie was trying to say. I actually liked the fact that in that there's a vocalized debate over vigilantism and gun violence in the movie. And before anyone there isn't says... There is a vocalized debate. There is. You have, no, no, it, no. There are... Sc- we needed to draw out the length of this movie, so interspersed into screen cuts, we have segments where talk show hosts spout, spout 20 seconds of dialogue. That is not at all the same as actually representing a debate. I don't know. I think you're being... I think you're, you're overly criticizing those radio scenes. Because I, I was listening intently during those cut scenes of Sway and whoever else is on that show, you know, having a debate amongst themselves. So they can't. So people are criticizing that, by the way. There, there's a criticism of how this is done, where you have white man cow, pro gun, you know, pro gun argument. You have black Sway, anti gun, anti vigilante argument. Except that Sway had somebody on the panel who was a black woman who was pro vigilante. So whatever. Um, this is another instance of people just wanting to say what they want to say because they are failed political bloggers, not actual film critics. Yeah. Um, well, some of them are actual film critics, but and it's, it makes them even worse. But I, I needed to point that out for people who were like, oh, of course, man cows, you know, is pro is a grieve pro white guy and sway is, you know, an, anti white pro black and, you know, an anti gun and all that. I'm like, nope, there was somebody on his panel who was black, too, who was like, you, you know, who saw the who saw maybe the necessity or the good in what Bruce Willis's character is doing. Um, Elizabeth Shue is terrible. <laughs> By the way, I don't know. I would disagree with I that. I don't know what happened to Elizabeth Shue, but she's not good in this. Um, the daughter is okay. Uh, I thought the the villains, you know, the the, the thugs were the MacGuffins. The right temperature they're of not, awful. They're not, they're not uh, anything. I I mean, no, I. The object was to get the audience to want to see cars get dropped on them and get shot and all of that. And they were the right kind of they, they were the right temperature of gross where I wasn't, you know, I was I, I, I wasn't at any time thinking, oh, they didn't deserve that. That's a little too much. No, I was OK with dropping a car on the one guy's head. Um. <laughs> to be fair, he deserved more. But for some reason, Eli Roth decided that on a major release, we're going to dial back the. Well, this Violence. isn't a Saw movie. It's it, it, it's Death Wish. It's, don't you know. don't no 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 no. This is the guy who literally brought about the Hostel franchise. Don't bring Saw into this. Okay, I should have said this isn't Hostel, um, but I haven't seen Hostel. I've seen Saw. Anyway, I've seen I haven't a seen Saw Hostel movie. either. I don't need to. Yeah, let's let's never let's let's never let's never review a Hostel movie. Anyway, no no no. It's going on my list now. Oh, of fuck things you. to make you watch. <laughs> Dude, you made me watch this. All right, there's so many things that you have made me watch. Okay. Um, speaking of aggrieved white people. Um, now, let's see. What else did I like about this movie? So I enjoyed the interspersing radio debate. I thought for a major release that <laughs> that's trying to avoid being way too preachy, I thought it, I, I thought it hit the right notes in terms of there's a there is an actual topic being talked about and because this is 2018 and we're not really an audience that does well with nuance by and large i thought it was fine for this kind of a movie nice nice and obvious um 
That's fair. Pe- there are people who didn't pick up on the subtleties, and there's heavy air quotes there, <laughs> around a few Michael Bay films. Like, there, it, there's a bunch of morons out there that need things spelled out in bright, flashing neon letters. Right. Um, I thought Vincent D'Onofrio's character, for what it was, was fine. Um, I, I like the turn on useless. I like the turn, the the turning on the head of 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 him being sort of the useless guy at the beginning, and at the end, he's sort of like the moral center of the movie. Um, I uh, let's see. I like the fact that it does culminate in the main lead robber getting his comeuppance with something that was set up earlier in the movie, you know, the rifle and the um, machine gun underneath the table. I thought that was fun. Uh, and I thought he was sufficiently creepy. I thought there was a a nice level of tension and creepiness in the elevator scene with him and Bruce Willis and the daughter. Um, so overall, you know, this was a brisk movie that was, uh, you know, contemporary in topic and motif that was just flat you know that that's that's the major problem with it in my opinion is not you know not all this other stuff that people talk about but i just quentin tarantino is a lot of style he he does a lot of violence too but he does it in a stylistic way that really makes the film sing uh that this is kind of the opposite of a quentin tarantino movie this is like here we're going to we're going to do a revenge flick a guy's going to shoot his way through a mob and that's kind of all this is, is a guy shooting his way through a mob um, with no style, no, no sense of uh, uniqueness. It's just there. That's my biggest criticism of Death Wish. It, I have so many things that I don't care for about this movie. <laughs> so, I hadn't picked that up. Speaking I mean, of subtlety. Part of it, I mean... Uh, you just hit that this is a, this is flat. It's not just flat in terms of dialogue and in terms of Bruce Willis's performance. It's flat in the action. Like there's nothing that grabs you and is interesting. I mean even the you know, even the torture scene is not it doesn't actually like get at your affect you viscerally the way those are supposed to. It's just kind of there. Well, you know, let, let's talk about that for a second. It was an odd choice cuz here's the thing. An angry father seeking revenge for his dead wife and an abused daughter uh, is a hero some of us can get behind. When he's torturing people, however, even if he's torturing them for information, it's kind of hard to continue to cheer him on. No, no. I- I'm all for that. Again, okay. I- but I you're a fucking more. weirdo. <laughs> most of us most of us would have some difficulty with that and that's why I thought it was an odd choice to even put that scene in the movie you know again I don't want to hurt you but if you don't talk to me and tell me what I want to know you're going to get hurt would be one thing he almost seemed to be reveling in that and it's like ah oh, now you're now you're crossing and then again if you're going to have a scene where he crosses the line then the next scene has to be him looking in the mirror going what kind of monster have I become there's no self-reflection in what he's doing. The, the, at no point does he even question it. And when even when Vincent D'Onofrio kind of points a finger at him and says, you can't do this, you know, he falls back on, well, who's going who's gonna to do it? The cops have failed. The system has failed. Society at large is failing. Somebody, ha- somebody has to stand up for what's right. And while one might be able to buy into the argument, the previous scene you were torturing somebody, this does not compute. Yeah. And I'm that would have been nice. Really would have liked that, actually. <laughs> but, you know, the movie isn't good, so we can't have nice things in it. <laughs> okay. The solid C. Yeah, you're being very generous. <laughs> That's me. <laughs> Social promoter of movies. Well, the best thing about this movie was ACDC's Back in Black paint playing over the credits so I could listen to ACDC on a theater system. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you, um... You, the, the themes and motifs of the movie didn't speak to you in any way? Yeah, I would... <sighs> you know that much as I love delving into themes and motifs, if there's enough 
bad things on the surface, I can't ever get to them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The, do you think this was a that. well-intentioned movie? It's Eli Roth. No. Okay. You, this is Eli. This is again. I'm, I, I keep comparing it to like a Quentin Tarantino movie. This is a shitty Quentin Tarantino movie. That's the impression I'm getting from you. That's Eli Roth's career. <laughs> shitty, like, Quint, shitty Quentin he Tarantino. Is the, he is the Kmart blue light special version of Quentin Tarantino. <laughs> Someone needs to make a thing of that, like a T-shirt Eli or something. Eli Roth is to Quentin Tarantino what Chris Tucker is to Kid Ro- to uh, Chris Rock. <laughs> okay, that's really funny, actually. Eli Roth, the shitty Quentin Tarantino. That's going on Twitter. <laughs> Go for it. I don't care. Like, <laughs> and bear in mind, I'm a guy who doesn't, who has been known to enjoy violent movies. Really have. I'm a guy who isn't really off put by gore on screen, as long as it serves a purpose. I mean, in all honesty, if they had gone gorier with this movie and just used it as a celebration, I think it would have been better. Mark would have hated it more, but I think as a film, it probably would have been stronger if you could at least point to something that it achieved. Instead of a horribly a horribly mediocre torture scene, and Bruce Willis being so not only old for the role, but painfully wooden. You know, I think he was going for a, uh, you know, he, he was going for a, a kind of emotionless middle middle class white guy that's pushed to the the, the fringes of basest, most animalistic emotions. And in- sure, but then he's still an emotionless middle class white guy when he is existing. Like, this is as bad as like Robert Downey Jr.'s violent rampage being expressed in a monotone. <laughs> or At the end of Civil more, War. Or, okay. Damn it, that's exactly what I was just about to say. For some odd reason, I heard you saying something different, but yes, that. Like, uh, if that's what you want to go for, you have to kind of go for it, you know? And just doesn't happen. I believe um, I've said that before. All right. Uh, Hashtag yeah, I, Death I, I Wish have... Movie Review. Hashtag Death Wish Movie Review thought. Eli Roth is the shitty Quentin Tarantino. It's again, like I don't really have almost anything good to say about this movie. Uh, the violence is slipshod. Like it, and this is not again. This is a director who is not shy about showing violence, but for some reason here, when it might actually fit, when you can actually maybe do something with it as a theme, as a method of storytelling, rather than as a, an end unto itself, it, he kind of looks away from it. It's. It's weird. I don't fully understand it. I uh, I don't know. Again, since you kind of brought up... the, Let me give you why I think I prefer the original. One is that, A, I don't mind that they... Especially for 1970, whatever. They went with a more kind of gritty, realistic... Almost makes you want to take a shower after seeing it style of film. Because it kind of gets under your skin and makes you kind of go, you, I must shower. I must bathe now. I must cleanse myself. And that kind of appeals to me. It's part, uh, one of the things that I find appealing about uh, Rob Zombie's The Devil's Rejects. I find that to be an interesting uh, film, film genre, you know, goal to have for a film. I also, with the original Death Wish, I kind of like that he doesn't actually go after his wife's, you know, the people who attacked his family, that this is a guy who winds up, and I know they don't convey this appropriately, and that's a whole other issue, who has just kind of had enough of everything at this moment, and then just starts indiscriminately, you know, killing people who have demonstrated proclivities for violence and murder themselves. I mean, the sequel is more where he actually goes after the people who attacked his family, which is Eh, I mean, those all, all those movies just like get worse and worse and worse until you get to death until you get to Death Wish Nine, which is just old Charles Bronson sitting in a hospital bed, hooked up to a machine, going, "Boy, I wish I was dead." <laughs> That's Simpsons reference. It is <laughs> very good. I have to get one in or so. Um, 
I mean, there's there's almost again, like, if you want to see a revenge movie, again, I can recommend Death Sentence, which is essentially the same story. But actually does it. But A, you have Kevin Bacon actually being allowed to act, so he emotes at times. I mean, there's a whole scene after he, in that movie, after he kills the kid who kills his son, which actually sparks that particular kid, guy's older brother to come back and kill his family. Because it actually, like, references how revenge becomes cyclical rather than actually solving anything. But after he does that, he actually has a scene where he breaks down in the shower. Uh, just collapses sobbing, apologizing over and over again because he's never done anything like that before. Let me ask you a question. Do you think as a society we, you know, we tend to embrace people who revel in violence and those who would be sickened by their own behavior and have that breakdown in the shower just tend to turn off moviegoers? You know, thus we embrace Charles Bronson who never has that moment in Death Wish well I'm sorry he does once he throws up but then he seems to get over it um, and he never looks back well it gets easier the more you do it um, but I mean you know in 2018 I'm just wondering you know if you're if you're right if you're sitting down to write a film and you're reaching a crossroads with like okay does should the character have a self-reflective moment where he realizes I'm a monster or you know should he revel uh, in, in the violence and and does that writer then reach the conclusion uh, people will think he's a pussy if, he, if we do the former so we'll do the latter if you're a bad writer that's what you think <laughs> if you're a good writer you understand that you can actually have those moments of self reflection and have them not come across as you know you can say undermining a pussy. the character but adding to it you, you can say a pussy it's fine I'm not going to. Okay. <laughs> you don't like to curse. How do you do a show with me every week? <laughs> who curses? Con- I, <laughs> who curses eh. constantly? <laughs> no, I, I really don't. Again, I'm LDS. So. That's, okay. I I won't make fun. Um, <laughs> I do enough of that. No, with go Ronnie ahead. Adams. We actually have a sense of humor about ourselves. Uh. Yeah, it, it is something that I. <laughs> you know what's hysterical about this? I'm just. I'm just kind of getting ready to do the next couple of bits here, and I'm looking at Rotten Tomatoes. 15% by the critics, 86% audience score. Could there not be a bigger divide between professional critics and the average moviegoer? Which brings me back to my thought on, you know, we're writing our heroes the way that we are because people who, who sense, you know, any thought that maybe you shouldn't shoot people in the face... Uh, because they made you angry or hurt you in some way is a pansy. Yeah, I went with pansy that time. Is that better? I don't care what you say. <laughs> okay. I, I just I think that that is a collective mindset of, of of a lot of people, and I and I think when you're when you're scrambling for for movie dollars, there's an interest in giving the people what they want, and what they want is is a hero who isn't afraid to, you know, isn't afraid to shoot everything that moves and not feel bad about it. Again, I get the point. I just, again, have to reference that if you're a good writer, those are scenes and moments that enrich the film, not detract from it. If you're a bad writer, and given the way this movie went, I'm going with the writer not being the greatest... Like, in absence of the ability to do depth with anything approaching competence, yeah, let's go one note. Well, here's the thing, and it's the, le- the last thing I'll say on that particular topic. Remember, we're living in the idiocracy. And subjectively, objectively, someone may be able to construct a scene where your hero is vulnerable in the face of so much violence... And artistically, it's great. And anyone with a soul, you know, with any ability to look at a film critically can appreciate it. But that's like one guy in a sea of a hundred idiots. And the night, you know, and the hundred idiots are all going, why is he such a pussy? No matter how well that, that, that scene is written. It's again. It's also not just the individual scene. It's how the scene relates to the rest of the film. But yes, you're still. There will, of course, be a bunch of morons. 
who just go, no, I want more explosions. <laughs> more explosions. I hate people. <laughs> um, here's my recommendation. You Don't know, watch this movie. I mean, it's better than the last Die Hard, as far as Bruce Willis movies go. Let's let's start there. Not the worst Bruce Willis. There's a perfectly cogent argument that a cert- that a couple of Michael Bay films are better than the last Die Hard movie. <laughs> um, hey, you'll be happy to know the la- the next Transformers movie, not Bumblebee, but the one a- but Transformers Six has now dropped off of uh, Paramount's calendar. So you dodged a bullet there, buddy. At least for now. No, no, it's not dropped off. It's just launched into the future. <laughs> Um, in any case, if you are one of those people who feels the need to see a folk hero that speaks to you in your perception of a world where you, you're feeling disempowered, um, if you like the idea of Punishers and John Wicks and Jason Bournes and whatnot, uh, go ahead and see Death Wish. It's fine. It's palatable. It's, it's inoffensive. <laughs> Um, and now Rob's going to tell you 10 movies that are better than this to go see and not waste your time yes. on this one. Go ahead. Yes. <laughs> Again, the aforementioned death sentence, which I find superior to this in every way, including the villain actually like being a character rather than random video game boss number 37. Uh, there's the actual Punisher series on Netflix, which is great. Yeah, it's it's a hundred percent superior to this. I didn't. I wasn't making a comparison. There's the Thomas Jane Punisher movie, which, despite being tonally wild and all over the place, is better than this. Yeah. There's the uh, Punisher War Zone, the sequel to the Thomas Jane one with um. Crap! I can't remember his name. Go ahead. I'll pull it up. Ah, but there's the Punisher War Zone, which significantly more stylized. Ray Stevens. That's it. Ray Stevens. Stevenson? One of those two. Ray Stevenson. Stevenson. Yeah, Ray Stevens is a comedic musician, I seem to recall. Anyway, Ray Stevenson, his version of the... Again, so there's that one, which is significantly more stylized and has better... uh, much better done action sequences. There's John Wick, the aforementioned, where Keanu Reeves... Keanu Reeves does a better acting job in essentially the same role than Bruce Willis does in this movie. Barring one scene in that film that just kind of makes me shake my head. There's John Wick Chapter 2. And next year is John Wick Chapter 3. Probably. No, it's there. Um, it's, on, it's on the list, actually. Uh, you'll have to see Chapter 2. Which I shouldn't hate. Like, I, again, I don't dislike... John Wick's a great... like. It's a, a near-perfect like late-night cable television movie. What a selling point. What? It is. How is that a bad selling point? Yeah, piquing my interest. Of course not. You also don't care for, you know, The Godfather half the time. That's not true. I didn't like The Godfather <laughs> 3. Anyway, are you done? Um, Hang on. Just revenge movies. Uh, there's actually one starring Dwayne Johnson called Faster that's not bad. Better than this, at least. Um, I think that's where I'll end. Uh, the original Death Wish, which I find more <laughs> enjoyable. Don't waste your time. Again, Mark's complete and utter monogam Like, your religious devotion to conventional narrative structure is admirable and tedious at the same time. <sighs> yeah, I like stories that actually tell a story that aren't, you know, gonzo porn. Um, all right, was there anything else? Oh, you know, there. you could actually go with the original Punisher movie starring Dolph Lundgren. <laughs> Come on, God. For years, I'm asking you why. Why are the guilty... Why are the innocent punished and the guilty alive? Where is justice? Where is punishment? And uh, again, which I'll tell you how much I thought about this movie that I can actually say that, you know, you you might actually go with the Dolph Lundgren Punisher. (laughs) Come on, God. For years I'm asking you. Okay, stop. (laughs)
He did it once. <laughs> once was enough. Uh, you know, the first time I actually heard that was not in the Dolph Lundgren Punisher, but at the beginning of a Biohazard song called Punishment. Punishment huh. for all my sins. Okay, don't don't start saying. Nah, 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 nah. All right. So I've given you a significantly greater number of movies to go see instead of this. Okay. Let's... Uh, I don't think there's any... Again, like if you want to see this movie, just make sure you stay through the credits because Back in Black on a theater sound system is pretty sweet. Or just go see ACDC Live. All right, here we go with... Boy, wouldn't that be nice if I could do that? <laughs> here, here we go with our second portion of three on this show called Damn You, Hollywood. Here comes the money. Here comes the money. Here we go. Money talk. Here comes the money. Money, 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 money. All right. On a budget of $30 million, the domestic gross apparently... Um, I, I don't have uh, worldwide numbers in front of me here, uh, but its domestic gross is currently uh, fourteen million. The weekend results for uh, March second through March fourth was it debuted at number three behind Black Panther, which is on its third week at number one, and Red Sparrow. We could see we could have done Red Sparrow instead of this. What do you think of that? Uh, I why would you give me those two options? Like I I will just like get into a car accident to get out of this. <laughs> um so Red Sparrow debuted at number 2 with uh, Jennifer Lawrence and then uh, the aforementioned Death Wish debuted at number 3. Game Night, which I also saw. I feel was, bad for you. That was fun. I enjoyed it didn't enjoy the people talking to the right and to the left of me and I had to had to move my seat lest I pull out a gun and shoot someone um game yeah, night. if you're gonna shoot someone people who talk in the theater is probably uh borderline justifiable indeed uh game night debuted at number two it has dropped to number four this week in its second weekend Peter Rabbit uh dropped I also saw that with my children went from three to four Annihilation in its second week has dropped from four to six. Uh, Jumanji, Welcome to the Jungle, is still making money, money, money. That... At this rate, The Rock will have two movies in the top ten in the first quarter of 2018. One of them will be Jumanji still sticking around at, like, number ten when Rampage comes out. A week earlier. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Jumanji. Well, sure, they moved up. Look, they moved up Infinity War. Everything else, every other studio went into panic mode and had to reschedule <laughs> what they were doing. Surprised they just didn't cancel the movie altogether. Uh, look, it's just already move, been made. Move everything like, to September. What they should have done was moved it forward a week. Like, take Avengers old spot. I don't know. How about move it to September? There's nothing coming out then. Um, Jumanji, Welcome to the Jungle. Fell from six to seven. Robert Winfrey and, Ro and Ronnie Adams' favorite movie this year so far, a movie they raved about, Fifty Shades Freed, fell from Never five... Never seen it. I've not seen any of them. <laughs> I saw it. I saw it with a girl who's not my wife. How do you like that? Uh, fell from five to eight. Was it your ex-wife? No. Oh, God. Bite your tongue. Um, <laughs> <ugh>. <laughs> I will end this podcast, sir. Uh, the Greatest Showman... Fell from 8 to 9, and Every Day, 2018, from Orion Pictures, in its second week, fell from 9 to 10. Um, having Sex with Water uh, rose from 13 to 11. The Shape of Water. I, I should have made you watch that movie. <laughs> I should have insisted that be on the schedule. Everyone's calling it, it Having Sex with Water. That's funny. Um, <laughs> anywho... Uh, rose from 13 to 11. The 1517 to Paris fell from 7 to 12. Three billboards outside Emming, Missouri, who is an Oscar uh, nominee. Uh, I think it won a couple of them. Oh, did it? Okay. Fell from 11 to 13. The Post, 12 to 14. Call Me By Your Name rose from 22 to 15. Darkest Hour, 18 to 16. All the post-Oscar things shuffled a little bit. Yeah. Phantom Thread, 14 to 17. Lady Bird, 19 to 18. And finally, I, Tanya rose from 20 to 19 
and Winchester, 17 to 20. So there you go. There's your top 20 movies uh, for the weekend, March 2nd through the 4th. Right now... This thing's going to lose money. Yeah, probably. Um, I just, you know, this weekend coming up, I believe is... Oh, gosh. What's this weekend? Uh, What's Friday? Oh, it's A Wrinkle in Time. Um, oh, and, and the other movie I'm going to go see, The Hurricane Heist. <laughs> why? Why? <laughs> Just why? Because I've got a movie pass, that's why. And this I can go see it. This ruining your life. I can go see anything. So between the, hur- between the Hurricane Heist... Tra- and- no, no, no. What troubles me is not that you can see anything with movie pass. It's that you choose to see the Hurricane Heist. <laughs> oh, hold on. Look, well, I'm going to take my kids to go see a rink. Look, let me explain something to you. Can I take? Can we talk for just a minute? Friday night is Mox night. Okay, that is my bowling night, as it were. That is my moose lodge night. That is my night of uh, water buffaloes. So you know, if, if Flintstones reference, you see what I'm saying? You, you pick it up what I'm putting down. Friday night is when I leave work at seven o'clock and I go to the movies and I have mock time. And this Friday, the big movie that's coming out is A Wrinkle in Time, uh, starring Oprah Winfrey. And I I'm, I'm taking hate that movie so much. And I'm taking my kids to go see it on Sunday, but that means I have nothing to see Friday night, and I don't need to see A Wrinkle in Time twice, like I did with Black Panther the last time this happened. So I needed something else to go see, and I looked at all the movies that are coming out and the movies that are out, and I said, "Well, what do I want to go see?" Well, The Hurricane Heist looks fun, and that's where we are. Uh, <laughs> just. Uh. I enjoy heist movies, and I enjoy disaster movies. This is a heist movie in the midst of a disaster. It sounds glorious. It, no. I it's, can uh, I can take a wrinkle in time off the schedule, and we can review the hurricane heist. Eh? Ooh, that's actually tempting. No. We must obey the mouse. No, no. You actually kind of like, hang on. I mean, I'm going to hate them both. Like, there, there, there is no win for me over that week. We're doing a wrinkle in time. Knock it off. The mouse yeah, demands right. it. It's Disney. And now the mouse can kiss my ass. <laughs> Anywho. In fact, um, I'm going to tell him that when I see him next week. You, oh, you're going to California, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, all right, so moving on to our... Uh, Black Panther is just dominating the universe in 2018. It's uh, it's on fire to hit a billion dollars. The first movie this year to do so. Uh, I'm sure Infinity War will will uh, eclipse it, but right now, do, lapping every other movie that's out there is Black Panther worldwide at 909 million dollars. Uh, in a this deep thing sec- might break a billion. No, it's going to. It's 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 absolutely on track to do to do so. They said the, its numbers in China alone will push it past a billion. So that's that's maybe regardless. Um, you want to take a wild I mean, guess? it's What's not these? a cultural phenomenon in China, so who knows? I mean, there's a lot of people. If, ever, if at least half of them go see a movie, it, it's you know, go see that one. It, it makes That's a billion true. dollars. So, That's very true. you want to know what's in second place worldwide? All over care. the world, Robert Winfrey? Do you want to know what people are going to see? What they're uh, wetting their whistles to? To tempting fate? What they're spending their hard-earned money for? Sure. Fifty Shades Freed. <laughs> yeah, this is why the world's going to hell. <laughs> why Bear the, in mind, this is why the are, Arabs the world will is win. Not going to he- the, the world is not going down the tubes, and people are going screw it. Let's see the Fifty Shades franchise. It's the, this thing started because society was crumbling. <laughs> oh, stop. You and Ronnie Adams need to go bowling. Fifty Shades Freed was a fine movie. He because no, he he had he had moral issues with it. In any case, um in third place is the Maze Runner the I Death Cure. I mean look, morally <laughs> if you want to make a moral debate out of it, why? The movie just sucks. You don't need to make a moral debate out of it. It's just a bad film. It was a fine piece of art. Uh, the and thing for- is badly written. The whole franchise, be that book or movie, badly written, badly acted. You were not executed. there in a theater full of women who applauded this thing as if it were Shakespeare. 
sir, clearly you're just not the audience for it, and you don't get how... No, I'm not a, a postmenopausal <laughs> woman desperately trying to reinvigorate my imaginary sex drive. I was not with a postmenopausal woman who thought this thing was pure genius. In fourth place is Paddington 2, brought to you by the good people at Warner Brothers who have wrecked the DC franchise. In fifth place is Insidious The Last Key. Sixth place, Peter Rabbit, and all of its issues with... Uh, Al, um... what were they? Uh, apparently there's <laughs> controversy around that. <laughs> yeah, I, that's what I was making fun of. Um, the commuter... Why is there Den- controversy around Peter Rabbit? Uh, because there's a scene where somebody goes into like anaphylactic shock because uh, the CGI animals are torturing him. Um, Den of Thieves, 12 strong, and fin- finally in 10th place is the, once again, the Warner Brothers product, the 1517 to Paris. I can tell you right now, everything from 7 down is going to get wiped off the mat over the next month as as your big, big time blockbusters start rolling in through the month of March. Uh, as I said, next week is a, wrink- a wrinkle in time that I'm sure dominate the weekend. Maybe it passes Black Panther, maybe it doesn't. I think that's the only thing that stands in its way, that everything else is going to get trampled. Uh, anything else on the money, sir? No, again, this is indicative of society crumbling. <laughs> this is why the Red Chinese will win. All well, right, they're crumbling just along with us. They're just not tell. They're just not publicizing it. You're right. I meant the Arabs. The joke is, this is why the Arabs will win. All they right, won't win either. Oh God! Don't you get it? Nobody wins. Everybody hurts sometimes. Everybody loses, and then the zombies come. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's a, put it on a t-shirt, Mindy. All right. Here we go. I have a question for you, Robert Winfrey. Are you ready? No! I said, are you ready? No, God! No, God, please, no! 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 <laughs> How do you like your new uh, bit intro? Uh, considering I actually couldn't hear that one, I assume it's the same one we played last time that Jesse kind of cobbled together of Are You Ready into the Michael Scott thing. Uh, close. It's it's Triple H asking twice, Are You Ready? and then Michael Scott. <laughs> Are you ready? No! Generic city I'm in tonight. I said, are you ready? <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> yeah, nailed it. All right. All right, folks. If you're seriously, ter- did they ever? I really do. Did just like it want at some point the crowd to just universally chant no when he said, "Are you ready?" Folks, if you can, you give us five minutes. <laughs> We're not ready, folks. If you've never listened to production, says no. <laughs> If you've never listened to Damn You Hollywood before, this is the part of the mo- this is the part of the review where we review the reviewers. We take a look at the one line or two line samples of reviews that are cobbled together on Rotten Tomatoes and we unleash the beast that is Robert Winfrey on the so-called professionals. And we do this because somebody has to watch the watchers and tell them they're shitty at their job. Here we go. They really are. Uh, Xenia Baria of the Times India. Oh, these are always great. <laughs> While the story is straightforward, it also tends to be predictable and doesn't keep you engaged throughout. The emotional connect is sketchy and the action sequences seem sluggish at best. Roth doesn't have a robust script to begin with. I would actually agree with all of that. Well, you won't agree with this. Chris Stuckman... You, Chris Stuckman, you. We don't like you. There's not a single memorable action scene. It's a mishmash of tones filled with wooden performances, a very boring lead character, and no clear-cut villain. Ugh. I mean, I want to disagree with that, but I'm struggling to. I mean, Well, they, come there on, is there is a clear-cut any... villain. Sure, who shows up at the end as a MacGuffin. <laughs> All right, moving on. Suddenly Zemo. <laughs> that doesn't deserve a suddenly Zemo. Um, Robert Clifford of Reeling Reviews. 
Now is not, okay. Here's where we get good. Robert Clifford of Reeling Review says, "Now is not the time to bring out a film that is positive about vigilantism and vengeance down the barrel of a gun. Besides all that, it's just not a very good film." Oh yes, because you, no, no, no. You couldn't just say it's not a very good film. It's not a very good film. But no, well, you must political, politically grandstand. We can't possibly have actual debate about the topic. How dare you glorify violence? Which violence scene would you like to discuss them glorifying? What lingering shot of physical trauma disturbed you? Because there weren't many. Oh, he, st- he staples his shoulder together. Have you not seen Roadhouse? Like, or Rambo. Genuinely. Or Rambo, any of them. I mean, there's actually a scene in Master and Commander when Paul Bettany performs abdomen surgery on himself. But no, this is the movie that we must take our, our a moral stance against. How dare we discuss the need for vengeance and the put upon society? You people, and this is all you leftist nut jobs, by the way. No, no, the people in Baltimore aren't rioting. It's an uprising. No, it's a riot. You dumbass. No. <laughs> but in this circumstance, no. Like, no, we shouldn't glorify violence, except when it's Antifa or complaining about police brutality. Then, yes, pepper spray random Samoans on the street and get punched in the face over it because you're a dumbass. We have a lot of these to like, get through. You're, you're gonna need. To, you're gonna need to I'm, edit I'm, yourself. Uh, okay. Okay. Keep going. I'm. I'm good with that one. We. I'm just saying this happens a lot. <laughs> throughout these reviews like Travis Hobson of Punch Drunk Critics as expected the film is as tone deaf as expected but so much else is wrong with it that audiences may be too busy laughing to notice what do you mean tone deaf like <laughs> hang on hang on hang on you, you moron do you not understand how this process works like do you genuinely not understand the filmmaking process Everyone who talks about, oh, this was, uh, this movie is tone deaf. How dare they, you know, not take into account the, you know, the shootings that occurred a week before. Because they filmed it in October of 2016. (laughs) Principal photography on the film began in late September of 2016 and then in October of 2016. They're tone deaf. Not when they shot it. <laughs> you, you bunch of idiots. Like, th- this is culturally insensitive and tone deaf to our current political climate. Well, when was it written? How long have they been shopping the script around? When was it shot? How long has it been delayed? How many times has its release been delayed? How many production issues were there? Ah, tone deaf. You're a bunch of idiots. It's only going to get worse. Ty Burr of the Boston Globe, top critic. Death Wish is a catchism for an audience terrified that their firepower and their influence are dwindling. I mean, hey, it's not like, you know, we have the presidency and still the House and the Senate. No, our influence is clearly dwindling. You, you, bunch, of, you, you bunch of coastal living jackoffs. <laughs> Coastal living. Sean Burns of the New England News no, Weekly. No, 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 no. Seriously. Speaking of Every coastal. one of these morons who thinks, no, no, the, the political power of the you know the conservative movement is waning. Do me a favor. Get off the plane next time you stop in Dallas. See what you see. Sean Burns, New England Movies Weekly, says, you'd think such a morally repugnant gun nut masturbation oh. fantasy. <laughs> would at least be worth getting worked up about. But the movie's so laborious and wheezy, it's almost pitiable. This is not a gun... No. Like, Rocket Raccoon has a gun fetish. All right? This is not any of that. I mean, I, I... You linked one of these that I assume we'll get to. I, I actually find it morally reprehensible that you apply... Such a broad, such a broadly and completely undeserved moral judgment to anyone who happens to either enjoy this movie or, you know, own a firearm. No, no, no. You're a bad person for disagreeing with me politically. No, you're a moron for thinking that. And I can say that about you specifically. 
you moron. Oh, God. All right. This one, this one isn't our Trumpiest review. That one's the one I sent you earlier, and we'll get to it. But this might be the get em Winfrey of the night. Okay. I don't, is anyone around in your house? Have you given everyone sufficient warning that this is probably going to be the one that makes your head explode and makes you start screaming? Uh, everyone's. I have a clear line of fire at the moment. They're, 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 we're okay. good. Do you need to get a drink? I got stuff around me. We're good. Sarah Mars of Laney Gossip. There is no good time for a movie like Death Wish. Oh, for the love of... You, you <laughs> sanctimonious douchebag. <laughs> There's no uh, here's what kills me. Hang on, hang on. Here's what kills me about this. If your point was there's not really a good time for a movie that is a slipshod as this, it's not as well put together. You know, it's if you were not, actually, you know damn well that's not her if, point. I know that. Hang on. If you were actually commenting on the quality <laughs> of the film, you might have a degree of competence in your job, but you're not. This is an excuse for moral sermonizing and virtue signaling on your part. There's never a good time to address revenge in the put-upon. There's never a good time to address crime rates and the fact that you know, the police force in this country is largely investigative rather than preventative. It's never a good time to discuss these things unless it wants to be done on your schedule and to your terms by and it's you know written and directed by oh who's a liberal jack off director any number of them T- Pick tim one. roth that. what tim roth sure then it's a cultural masterpiece but if it happens to be even vaguely apolitical or opposed to your belief structure it must be struck down you fascist jack off like what what's the matter with you it's never a good time. Who the hell are you to actually pass that kind of cultural <laughs> judgment for 300 million Americans or 7 billion people on the planet? Who anointed you? You've got a keyboard and a mediocre job and a failed – and like a political science degree that you can't actually use for anything, so you review films. How dare you? Like genuinely, how dare you – cast that kind of pall across such wide swatches of humanity. I hate people indiscriminately. Your response is, no, it's never a good time to act- to have a-, a movie that deals with things that disagree with me politically. Y- you-, you miserable, fragile little jackass. I once dated a girl like this. You know, it was never a good time to Sorry. disagree with her. That's why we don't... Why wife? didn't... Huh? Was it your first wife? No, that was a whole different kind of crazy. This was a this was actually in the in in the shadow of my first wife after after I left her. Uh, Rashid Irani, Hindustan Times. Rather than acting as social commentary, the remake merely exploits the overarching themes of crime and punishment to unleash more violence and death. No, that's the first movie. That's the original. Yeah, that really is much more the original than it is this one. <laughs> <laughs> this one tried. No. Uh, Robert, <laughs> if so- someone like our good friend Benjamin Colonna, somebody, just needs to draw a picture of like you in a cage and me feeding you steaks, because that's what this is. This is a big, raw, boned steak ready to feed you. Robert Denniston of Denniston Unleashed. I'm not sure we ever needed a Death Wish reboot, but we sure as hell don't need one now. Ugh. Okay. Again, if you were actually suggesting that we don't need to remake a movie that was a phenom for its cultural time and is looked back on fondly via nostalgia, because what does it actually add? Is it actually going to be any good? Then that's that's something. You know, that that's actually a point. That's not what you're saying. And we all know that's not what you're saying. What you're saying is, I don't like this. It makes me uncomfortable. Take it away. This is... This is a poor way to go through life. <laughs> All right. Especially if your profession is, you know, film review. You're as bad as Leonard Malton who's like, oh, God, another Marvel movie. Steven Silver of Splice Today. An abomination. And the favorite movie of the year for people who like to say, yes, but what about black-on-black crime in Chicago? 
zero out of five stars. Really? Hold on. An abomination? Really? This That's isn't... A- does this not scream of people like out tr- out trying to you know to do the others as terms of who could be the biggest re- liberal you douchebag? You all read each other's reviews and decided I must one up this. <laughs> yes. The only way that my miserable little opinion will actually be noted is if I'm capable of becoming more outlandish than the previous person, and it's just going up and up and up and oh god, how how must how can I escalate? I must escalate. Never mind that there's a... You could actually argue there's a theme in the film and the subject material about escalation and how futile it is. But no, no, we must escalate. Ugh. This is not an abomination. This is not... It's not good, but come on, man. Like, this isn't the room. This isn't Manos Hands of Fate. This isn't... Showgirls. Sure. Like, there's all these movies, or actually, the first Hostel. I would, you could probably make a stronger argument. This isn't the original, oh, what was it? Cannibal Holocaust. Yeah, the, this isn't the original Cannibal Holocaust. It's not even Eli Roth's remake of the Cannibal Holocaust, which he actually called, like, Green Inferno, I seem to recall. It's it's none of those. Like, No. This is not a, by any stretch of the imagination, an abomination. It's just not a good movie. Those aren't the same things. The fact that you're now going to that extreme just completely invalidates your opinion. Like, you've what. shown you're, doing, you're willing to do nothing but exaggerate and you know, go into hyperbole for the sake of, please pay attention to me. It's one of my favorite reviewers, because this, one, this one's another one with her nose firmly in the air. And head firmly up around our own ass. Katie Walsh, Tribune News Service, uh, top critic. The film cranks up the audience with little jokes and references and gets the audience cheering for the Grim Reaper before they even realize what they're cheering for. And therein lies the problem. No. <laughs> like, how do you miss the point? Like, okay, A, he kills people before they name him. Like, that's a thing. Second, the point is that this was a normal man pushed to pushed beyond what he considered rational and to act in an irrational manner. If you want to argue about how badly the movie did that, that's fine. That's not your point. Your point is, all I want to do is feel morally superior to someone who shoots another human being regardless of circumstance. How dare our police officers carry firearms and not batons? Okay. Uh, (laughs) Here's our Rolling Stone review, and it's very Rolling Stone of it. David Fear, top critic. He's not remaking Death Wish. He's making what he thinks a person in 1974 sitting in a 40-deuce Groundhouse, grindhouse theater would have seen in their mind while watching it. How very Rolling Stone of this person. Yeah. There's writing to your audience and then there's pandering to your editor. I feel this is the latter. Uh, Jeffrey M. Anderson of Common Sense Media. Director Eli Roth's remake of the 1974 Charles Bronson movie is not only awful, <laughs> but it's also incredibly thoughtless with a brutish, simple-minded argument. Okay. Okay, hold on. The argument is not is neither brutish nor simple-minded. Let me be very, very clear about that. If you're arguing that it makes it in a brutish and simple-minded point, fine. Again, I don't actually care much for this movie, but to demonize the whole notion of the right to protect yourself as being brutish and simple-minded is... It undermines the fabric of Western civilization. Like, no, you do not have the right to defend yourself. You do not have the right to protect those you love. or to. No, you don't have that right. Shut up. Cower in a corner. Unless we disagree with you, in which case, violence. 
because that's the way political discourse goes in this country right now, it seems. Just... Christopher Llewellyn Reed of Film Festival today. Death Wish deserves a quick demise. Well, sir, you're going to get your wish because next week, a wrinkle in time. Yeah, it's not going to make its money. And it's only, I mean, it's 90, it's what, 100 minutes long? It's not a long movie. And, and bear in mind, if you're going to throw around words like deserves, it deserves a quick demise. No, like Transformers deserved a quick demise. Instead, it drug on for five movies across ten years and just made my life miserable. <laughs> uh, let's see here. A, lo- a lot of criticism of Bruce Willis's performance as he slept walk through it, which we've already he talked kinda about. Did. He, he, he kind of did, let's be fair. <laughs> uh, let's see. Maitland McDonough, McDonough, a film journal international. In the end, it's just another macho fantasy about good guys with guns and good guys is in quotes. Wait, <laughs> I got to add to that one. Matt Zoller cites of RogerEbert.com, top critic, vigilante dad rock. <laughs> okay. Well, let me start with this. Just for historical perspective. The only thing that ever really stops a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun. This is documented. This is documentable. This is provable throughout, again, let me throw out Western civilization, but like the course of human history. A bad, evil human being with a weapon is stoppable pretty much only by a good human being with a weapon or multiple of them ideally that's just the way that is now the notion that this is just a macho fantasy no like commando's a macho fantasy really and and a pretty good one this really isn't like no one should really kind of fantasize about the totality of this film Hey. Again, finding a rocket launcher and rescuing your daughter while being Arnold Schwarzenegger in the, you know, <laughs> early 90s, yes. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, yeah, again, if you want to fantasize about being Schwarzenegger in the mid-90s, finding a rocket launcher and mowing down an army on an island because you're Arnold Schwarzenegger, sure. That's a macho fantasy. Being a quiet, somewhat desperate, middle-aged, older... I mean, it's Bruce Willis. Bruce Willis is 60-something. He's not middle-aged anymore. Older, bald man uh, whose family is violently taken away from him and then goes on a murder rampage? No. You sh- no. <laughs> like, that's not, a tr- that's not a macho fantasy. Jeffrey Lyles of Lyle Movie Files. Death Wish is a poorly timed rebuttal. And a pretty lousy one at that. It's not a rebuttal. To, you, why do you ascribe these things to this movie, people? It's not a rebuttal. This thing was filmed, again, in the fall of 2016. You know what's funny? This how, next... is that, how does that make this a rebuttal? <laughs> I, uh, I gotta read this just because, just because. Now, it's a rotten review. We gave it a D+, which I think is hilarious. But it agrees with my uh, with my assertion that by this is AA Dowd of the AV Club, top critic. By most metrics, this death with Death Wish is a better movie than the first one. I agree. You're absolutely right. I, I don't, but we've been over that. This guy's just poking at people to poke at them. Um Glenn Walt Weldon of NPR. Well you know where this is headed. Top critic. <laughs> I wonder. <laughs> It asks nothing and offers only the blanket assertion that feelings of masculine inadequacy, the most important thing a man can do is protect his family, and I failed, Willis declaims, can be obviated ballistically. Okay, you know, for a... Let me say this, first of all. As a representative of a radio station whose political agenda centers around feelings... uh, identity politics and safe spaces 
the fact that you are bringing this up as a negative only completely invalidates your ability to be objective. It's simply utilizing feelings against you. It's feelings that you don't agree with, and therefore, how dare you bring up feelings? Instead of feelings that I do agree with, in which case, how dare you argue against them? It's sad and vaguely pathetic. This is a fresh review, but it confuses me. <laughs> and and I and I'm reading this. The fact that it's fresh confuses me. That's all that needs to be said. <laughs> and and I'm reading this because Robert often likes to say, you often like to say that I hate you. And I'm you curious do. if this is the one that's going to send you into cardiac arrest. I, I I'm actually I'm I'm reading this as a scientific experiment to see if this is the one that finally drives you over the edge. Christian Toto of HollywoodInToto.com says, You won't see a more subversive movie in our woke age this year or maybe next. Okay. I have a very <laughs> pointed response to this. Hang on. Does it involve the word fuck? <laughs> Did you just fart into the microphone? No, I have. As a gag for Christmas three or four years ago, somebody got me uh, one of the uh, the fart gun from Despicable <laughs> Me, and I have it by my computer. Oh, terrific. <laughs> Boy, do I Here's miss our soundboard. <laughs> um, look, you used... Uh, let me start with this. You used woke. This automatically disqualifies you from intelligent discussion or civilized <laughs> society. So this next one is our good friend Roger Moore. So, hang on, hang on, hang on. Oh. Second, do you not understand what subversive means? Have you not actually looked up the definition of the word? Subversive is... Okay, here's a better example of subversion. Uh, there are only two decent movies from Roland Emmerich. One of them is the first Independence Day. The other is a movie called The Patriot starring Mel Gibson. Very young Heath, young Heath Ledger as well. The reason that particular movie, especially the title, is subversive is that Mel Gibson, throughout basically that entire movie about the Revolutionary War in South Carolina, he is not on the side of independence. He's not against it, but he is not actively supporting the revolution. He is not, by definition, a patriot to like the very end but it is again therefore a subversive title because it subverts your expectations how the hell is a movie called Death Wish showing a man wishing to both die and kill people wishing to die and kill people subversive <laughs> nothing about this movie is subversive you may not like it that's fine. You may disagree with it. Also fine. The language matters, you blithering jackass. <laughs> All right, moving right along. Roger, our good friend Roger Moore, who every week defies us to stick a, uh, a trout or some sort of fish in his tailpipe or in his hubcaps. An old man's movie made for even older men, impotent, angry ones. Sir, aren't you, like, 400 years old? Okay. Hang on. <laughs> a, the, I question your... I mean, if you're going to bring up the issue of virility, your own age might come into question. This is not a movie for old men. It stars an old man. Certainly plays towards an older demographic, perhaps, but that's not the same thing. Second... The fact that one is old does not in any way, shape, form, or fashion mandate issues of virility. I mean, Hugh Hefner, like, died getting it on. That was never a man who had a problem. Jack Nicholson apparently still enjoys the occasional physical uh, tryst. Like, no. To enjoy this movie, you need to have suffered head trauma, not be an old, impotent man. And seriously, if anyone knows this guy, find a dead fish. <laughs> Remove his hub... No, no, no. Remove his hubcaps. Stick the fish inside the hubcaps, reattach them. 
Randall Colburn of Consequence of Sound. There's something distinctly odious about a storyteller, storyteller exploiting both a city's tragic reality and a country's debate about firearms to make a film that thrives on violence. Are you getting oh, the themes of these the reviews? Horror. Are you getting the themes how, of these reviews? How dare you? I mean, A, again, let me stress this. This is not a cultural rebuttal. It was filmed, what, 18 months ago? Ish? Roughly. Call it 18. I know it's not exact, but for the sake of rounding. It's not designed as a cultural rebuttal. How dare this film, you know, make a... I mean, how dare Steven Spielberg make Schindler's List if this is going to be your line of logic? So there's two more I want to read because they're really stupid. And then there's our Trumpy, <laughs> there's our Trumpy review. And then we're done. Okay, let me just let me just read through these real quick, and then the, these two, and then hey, your remarks, and then we'll do the Trumpy one, and then we'll get out of here. Matt Goldberg of Collider. Unlike the original Death Wish, where violence ruins everything it touches, in the remake, it's a cure-all. Happiness is only a semi-automatic away. Uh, and then you have, I uh, just that, how. How do you people not look again? Not defending this movie necessarily, but if you don't get that he only found happiness when his daughter came back into his life, like the, the I don't know what to tell you. Like the act of vengeance that he is taking, the violence does not actually help him. Not to mention the fact that after watching Death Wish, I'm not entirely sure where he gets the you know violence ruins everything it touches. Charles Bronson gets away with murder. Just gets away with it. And he goes on to continue doing his architecture thing in a new city. He's in no way punished. He's mildly asked to relocate. That's it. Uh, Vincent Mancini of Film Drunk. Now is such a terrible time to release a movie about white vigilante taking out the trash that I expected it to justify its existence somehow. It never did. If anything, it's less satirical than the original. Okay, first of all, if you any any film that any film critic that asks a movie to justify its existence is not the kind of critic that should be listened to. Like people paid to see it, there are justified its existence. That's what I've always said. And our Trump and it's a perfectly val and that's a perfectly valid perspective. Like justify your existence in what method? Like what what method? How would you like me to do this? <laughs> How about the dozens, if not hundreds, of you know, costume designers and camera crew and technicians that got paid to make it? Continuing to gainfully employ people is not justification for you, you moron. In our Trumpiest review of the night, because there's always got to be one, Don K of Den of Geek. How's your heart? Are you do? How's your your general health, Robert Winfrey? Are you okay? Can you can you bear this? Can you bear the I'm burden? I'm good. I get to punch people tomorrow. All right, here we go. I actually, punched people today, but that was kind of impromptu. Death Wish is an NRA member's wet dream, a perfect uh, film for the America that only exists in the poisoned imagination of the pathetic would-be bully in the White House. I would have had more respect for Don Kay had his entire review just been I hate Trump. It would have been more coherent. Yeah, look. Let me start with this. No NRA member has wet dreams about their family being assaulted and killed. I mean, literally, how dare you? How dare you ascribe that to millions and millions of Americans. Second of all, you are one of these coast-living blowhards who does not understand or care to acknowledge say 45 of the 50 states. To your line of thinking, sir, and I feel pretty confident saying this, if it does not take place in California, New York, maybe Atlanta or Chicago, apparently, you don't think it counts. You are perfectly willing to discount, marginalize, overlook, and 
discriminate against anyone who disagrees with you based on no in no small part on their geolo- on their geographic profile. Uh, you are in a very real way emblematic of what is so wrong with so much of society. And not just because you disagree with me, mind you. I don't give a... I, I do not care that your view on life runs contrary to my own. I, I really couldn't care less so long as you can be civil about it. And apparently you can't. But the fact that you are willing to so broadly paint huge categories of people as being morally bankrupt and evil simply because they disagree with you. Really, who's the racist here? Is it the guy saying all white people who are members of the NRA are racists? Because that seems like a racial call on your end as opposed to anyone else. Certainly me. Saying, no, you're a moron. Because no... <laughs> <laughs> you're a moron, and quite frankly, you're bordering on racism. I mean, technically, it is racist. You bloviating jackass. <laughs> all right. I think we've uh, had all we can stand, and we can't stand no more. So. More importantly, hang on, hang on, hang on. Oh, more importantly. God. Very briefly, very briefly. Have you not paid attention to Donald Trump's actual political agenda? I mean, the man just... He very recently suggested removing due process from the confiscation of firearms. One of his actual proposals was, let's take guns away from people and then have due process to get them back. But no, no. Clearly this is his, like, wet dream. Like... What's the matter with you people? Like, you know, I, I, I want my narrative, and I want to feel good about saying what I want to say, and how dare you say anything differently. Like, I, hate, I hate all of you miserably, miserably untalented, failed, failed political commentators who decide to clog up film review by utilizing it as nothing more than an excuse to foist your political views onto anyone reading. You all are a blight. On film criticism in general. I do love this portion of our show. And you'll get to hear us do it all again next week on A Wrinkle in Time here on Damn You Hollywood. Oh, okay. Recorded Tuesday so nights this movie. on the Rattledge and Broadcasting Network on Spreaker. Uh, and just rounding out the month of March, we'll have Tomb Raider, um, which will be recorded on March 20th, and Pacific Rim Uprising recorded on the 27th and if you just love robert and i doing reviews you get to hear a bonus show we got a tv party tonight a week from thursday thursday uh Uh, wait what day is that uh that would be the 15th okay i'll be i'll still be available for that one uh thursday uh, march 15th the we will be reviewing jessica jones season (laughs) <laughs> for a TV party tonight. As for this week, we got Full Manchu, Clone of the Universe, on the Metal Hammer of Doom. We decided not to do the new Andrew WK, as the new Andrew WK sounds like a PSA for suicide prevention, and I wasn't into it. So we moved some stuff around on the calendar. Not into suicide prevention? Not I into mean. PSAs about it, as, 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 posing as metal albums. I mean, considering uh, that it's a significant part of your job description, I can understand you not wanting to do it in your private time. You have no idea. So uh, we're going to skip the new Andrew W.K. Look, it, it, it wasn't great. I don't feel like talking about it. So instead, we're going to put on Wait, some Wait, I that's... can use that excuse? I can. You can't. Um, oh, damn it. <laughs> so instead, we're going to play some of that stoner metal you know and love, Fu Manchu, Clone of the Universe. And uh, On Trial is back. I will be prosecuting Death Wish, as you heard some of my arguments tonight, and Sean will be defending it. And somewhere out there, Pat will be burning me in effigy. Pat Mullen loves the Death Wish. Already did. I can't believe you didn't see the live stream. What? What? He already burned you in effigy. Didn't you see the live stream? Oh, okay, got it. I'm with you now. Ha! 
Next week, it's all Jessica Jones all the time. Not really. It's only two shows out of four. Uh, source material, we'll be doing Jessica Jones Volume 1, Uncaged. Uh, the aforementioned Damn You Hollywood or Wrinkle in Time. Ministry okay. has a new album out, I speaking of Trumpy. The person standing on the hill of that movie is terrible. I'm <laughs> calling that right now. Terrific. Uh, Ministry's got a new album out, speaking of Trumpy. Um, so we'll be reviewing America Ministry is can't. Trumpy. <laughs> um, on the Metal Hammer of Doom, and then as the as I said before, Jessica Jones season two on TV Party tonight. The week after that, we've got Tomb Raider Volume One, Season of the Witch on Source Material. We'll be reviewing the new Tomb Raider reboot. Uh, now that will be Mark and Ronnie, not me. I will be in right. Disneyland hopefully that Tuesday. That's right. Yes, Ronnie Adams and possibly Jesse Starcher will be joining me uh, for a double shot as we review the new Tomb Raider. Uh, Metal Hammer of Doom will be reviewing the new Judas Priest Firepower. And then another on trial for the month of March Tomb Raider 2 Cradle of Life. And we round out March with uh, celebrating the uh, debut of Krypton on the Sci Fi Network, which airs March 21st. We'll be uh, doing our little ode to that show with Superman The Many Worlds of Krypton on source material. We'll be reviewing. You know, the most interesting thing about the Tomb Raider movies is that Daniel Craig and Gerard Butler are in the first and second, respectively. Okay. Uh, Damn you, Hollywood Pacific Rim Uprising on March 27th. Looking forward to that because I do love my monster movies, um, especially robots punching monsters. And finally, speaking of Stoner Rock that you know and love, we'll be reviewing the new Sword album, Used Future, on the Metal Hammer of Doom. March 28th, and that will take us out of the month of March in 2018. The winter of Robert Winfrey's discontent. Considering winter only really showed up here over the last like month and a half, that's not <laughs> inaccurate. Like, I right. know, we, we had like two snowstorms less than that probably at our elevation. Um, right. Like over Christmas, like during that stretch of time the last like two and a half weeks not nah, snow like seven inches do your plugs there uh snowman um this sunday there will be a 411 ground and pound radio show we will be previewing ufc fight night 127 it's a fight pass exclusive card the ufc returns to london with a headliner between a brazilian and a russian <laughs> seriously it's a uh, verdum and volkov sounds great and Eh, Mark, you don't like heavyweights. You don't like good heavyweights, let me rephrase that. You only like bad heavyweights. I'll be in Daytona Beach or Cocoa Beach. It won't matter. I won't be watching it. Um, then the Sunday after that, we will be reviewing that particular event. Uh, I will be on... Make sure I actually have my dates correct for that. Yeah, we'll preview that. Eight, the 18th, we'll review that. I will be on vacation from the 20th to the 24th, so you get, I believe, Ronnie Adams here to review the new Tomb Raider. If I happen to get in to the hotel on time, like I might see if I can get into that one. I'll have to see it on Friday, but that's not a big deal. So I'll, I'll put that in my back pocket, depending on how we're soon we're able to leave and how soon we're getting, we get into, again, Anaheim. But it's a few days in Southern California. A good friend of my brother and mine li works at Universal. He's so we're gonna go do that. We'll go spend a couple of days at Disneyland. Uh, you know, basic family vacation. I actually have to bid adieu to my long hair tomorrow in preparation for that. Uh, as for, other than that, uh, I think that's it actually um, for my plugs. Again, we'll be back next week where we will talk about A Wrinkle in Time and people fought over Oprah for no reason. <laughs> Seriously, she's terrible. All right, for your host of this here program, Robert Winfrey, and uh, myself, your mandated reporter, and frankly, I'm mortified, Mr. Mark Radledge, this has been... Oh, hey. Uh, you can find us uh, you can find us on uh, iHeartRadio now apparently. Yes, you can. And and it's it's we're helping out with the numbers. People are finding us on iHeartRadio. Hope you're enjoying us. Hope you enjoyed this show. Uh this has been well, your friends. Trying to build something here, people. <laughs> Indeed. 
this has been Damn You Hollywood on the Rattle Legend Broadcasting Network on Spreaker. Find us wherever you download your favorite podcast, whether it be iTunes, TuneIn Radio, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, or you can find us on the Spreaker website itself at the Rattle Legend Broadcasting Network, uh, etc., etc. Ladies and gentlemen, be well, be safe, and behave. your phone everywhere work school the movies now you can bring it to an xfinity store for an easy way to switch to xfinity mobile a new kind of network designed to save you money you can get up to five lines of talk and text included with xfinity internet at no extra cost so all you pay for is data it's never been easier to switch to xfinity mobile and keep the phone you love click here to see how Sorry, I gotta take this. Restrictions apply. Limited to select mobile phones. Requires activation of a new line of Xfinity Mobile. Up to five devices per account. New Xfinity Internet customers limited to up to two lines pending activation of Internet service.